Well, we're going to continue our study through the book of Psalms as we're looking at summer psalms. And today we're going to look at Psalm 63. And it's a wonderful psalm of desperation and crying out to God. I was thinking about all the things that are going on in our world today. And, and so many times we look and we say it is such a strange world that we live in. Uh, there is uh, heat waves in Europe. There's fires everywhere. There are values that are being portrayed and proclaimed that, of course, as Christians, we have some struggles with. And, and uh, we can get angry at those things, or we can get really desperate with the Lord. And this psalm really talks about being desperate for God and calling out to God and crying out to him. And so David says in verse 1, you, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the riches of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I will remember you. And I will think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you, and your right hand upholds me. And so, Lord, we are so thankful that this describes the God that we serve, that you are a faithful God. And we pray as we look at this passage of Scripture and we see David's heart, that we would be again inspired to call after you and to find in you our hope and our confidence, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when I was about nine years old, we made a road trip uh, from Edmonton area down to California. And of course, you know, as you travel that far, you, you were able to witness a lot of different kind of terrain. So we saw the prairie grain uh, moving in the wind, which is always a beautiful sight, and the beauty of the snow-capped mountains. We saw the roar of the ocean, which when you're growing up in Alberta, is pretty exciting to see that roar of the ocean as it crashes against the waves crash against the shore. And we even experienced, at least for me, the first time, the heat of the desert. And of course, it was kind of comical because our car didn't have air conditioning back then, at least ours didn't. And uh, so we were sweltering. And there was, there was uh, I think, nine of us in the car. And we were just sweltering. So we got bo uh, little buckets of water and we held towels up against the back windows, just trying to get some some cool air, and I and I smile as I and as as I think about us trying to maneuver, wetting a towel, getting it up, and uh, just laughing at that. Well, you know, as we go from here to heaven, and we go through this process of life, we pass through various trains in life as well. I think of all those that are in Bible camp right now, and my daughter just finished speaking at at mid camp. And uh, I'm mindful of what God is doing in the lives of, of the kids there and how and there's moments. And we look back at our, maybe our camp experience and there's moments where we experience the power of God. And it feels like there's one fresh wave after another as we feel and sense the Holy Spirit moving in our lives, much as we would sitting at the ocean's edge watching the waves come in. And then there's times where we experience the majesty and splendor of God where we experience just how small we are and how big he is. And it kind of reminds me when we drive through the mountains and with all their grandeur and reminded that we know the one who created them all. Then there's times where we just sit quietly and we read the word of God and we sense his Holy Spirit just speaking to us as we read his word. And, and we just instantly know that this is a time of growth in our lives, a time of harvest maybe harvest of faith or joy, peace, maybe even a growing and maturity in our walk with God. And, and we anticipate the purposes of God being carried out in our lives, much like a farmer would anticipate a tremendous harvest as he sees his crops sway in the wind. 
But what about those times where we feel that we're in the desert? We're in the wilderness place. It's hot and dry, and nothing seems to be growing there, and just life seems hard and, and difficult. And it's here in the wilderness, it's here in the desert that we often feel like giving up. Maybe we ask, is it really worth it? Is it worth it, my, my serving Jesus? Because at the moment, maybe we don't see much beauty there. At least from our perspective, we don't see much life or, or growth. Some would even suggest that there must be something wrong with us. Believers aren't supposed to go through wilderness experiences. Churches aren't supposed to face those desert moments. But as we'll see in the scriptures, oftentimes it's in the wilderness, in the desert place where God comes and moves and visits in such a powerful way that those who experience him there are never the same again. It's in the wilderness that Hagar met the God who sees me, the God who knows everything about me. It was in the desert where Moses saw the burning bush and was given a new mission from the Lord. It was in the wilderness where Joshua received his training because he would be the one who would lead Israel after Moses. It was in the wilderness that Elijah heard the still, small voice of the Lord. It's in the wilderness that Jesus communed with the Father before he began his wilderness. And it was in the deserts of Arabia that God prepared Paul to take the gospel to the Gentile nations. And now in our psalm, in our passage, David finds himself in the Judean wilderness running from King Saul. And even though physically he's there in that wilderness place, we see that his heart is not a desert. No, his heart is not barren. His heart is full of praise to God. And so if we ever find ourselves feeling like we are in a desert place, maybe there's something we can learn from psalms such as this that will help us to make sure that our hearts don't become barren or our souls become weak. So what does David do in this psalm that helps him? Well, the first thing he does is he affirms his relationship with God. He says, you, God, are my God. That's the first thing he does. He sets all doubting aside. And this is important because oftentimes it's in those barren moments, those wilderness experiences where the devil tells us, well, see, that's proof that God has forsaken you. You're wasting your time serving the Lord. But David stands firm, and he says, God, oh, God, you are my God. You're mine by choice. See, when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, we at the same time choose to follow him. And just because things can be difficult in life, just because things can be challenging at the moment, doesn't mean that we will uh, turn our back on the Lord. No, remember that old song, I have decided to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. Why would they have to say no turning back if everything in life was always wonderful, if it was one victory to the next and there was no desert terrains to walk through in life? There would be no need to say no turning back. But it's in those moments that are challenging and hard and discouraging that we need, again, to remind ourselves that we are serving the Lord, that it's not a grit your teeth and hold on type of thing. No, rather it's that affirmation that says, I've made my choice and I don't regret it. I don't regret serving the Lord. In fact, the only thing I might regret is not choosing him sooner. And then he's ours by covenant. You know, before Jesus died in the Lord's Supper, he took the cup and said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And when we give our lives to Christ, we enter into a new covenant with God where Jesus becomes our Savior and our Lord. Now, Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter two. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, have been brought near 
by the blood of Christ. And that's so reassuring because when we stand before the Father and he says, what right do you have to come into my heaven? We can say, I have a right because I am a child. I am your child by covenant. I have received the blood of Jesus and I stand in his righteousness and his purity. Not in my own, but in his. And that's such a wonderful thing. So he's ours by choice, by covenant, but also by confession. You know, the old devil likes to come and use our feelings or our doubts to confuse us, trying to confuse our heart and our mind, especially in those moments where life is challenging or, or it's confusing or it's just barren. And we feel like we're just spinning our tires, perhaps. And it's good in that moment to kind of remind ourselves that our faith and our trust is not based upon our feelings, but our our faith and our trust is based upon the truth of the Word of God, which, for instance, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. And so there's those moments that we say, listen, this is what the Scripture said, and I have done that. With the breath that you have put in my lungs, Lord, I have confessed that you are Lord. I'm yours. And while the devil will come and, and try to assure us that we're not, faith can rise up and declare, no, I believe, and I continue to believe. And until I decide that I no longer want to believe, then he is my God, and I am his. And so he affirms this relationship with God, and then he expresses this longing for him. You, God, are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole body longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. For years, the people of California have been warned that they were in danger of running out of drinking water. And yet, according to an article dated May 14, 2022, despite the fact that water levels are at critical low, water usage is up. In other words, the people of California are behaving as if there's no issue at all. And I wonder if in the midst of some desert experiences in our lives, when it's becoming evident that we really are desperate for God to move in our life and our situation, and we need God, we cannot survive without him, it can be so tempting for us just to carry on as if there's no issue at all. No need to pray, no need to call out to God, no need to to add the disciplines of faith. I mean, if we're doing those things, let's carry on. But I'm talking about those times that we, that we neglect. We get lazy in our faith. You see, what happens in the heat, the heat of the desert is it zaps our strength, not just our physical strength, but our emotional strength and our spiritual strength. And if water and shelter can't be found, then things can become perilous. And David recognizes this. And he senses that without the help of the Lord, he could be in big trouble. But he doesn't want to just go through the motions. No, his heart is crying out to God. He says, earnestly, earnestly I seek you. Not you, your favor, not not your blessing. No, but you, Lord, you are the one that I seek. And I wonder, and I ponder, and I ask myself this week, am I earnestly seeking God? Is this something that's part of my heart and my desire? Do I rely upon the past reserves? You know, what God did for us years ago, and and, and those things are wonderful, and we mark those moments because they remind us that God is faithful, and he brought us through the desert back then. He can bring us through the desert now. But do we long and thirst for a fresh touch of the Spirit of God? These last few years, have been challenging. These last few years have been hard on all of us. Regardless of what you think of everything, we have all experienced how difficult they can be. And maybe if we're honest, they can 
may have even left us a little bit dry spiritually. We can pretend that's not the case, or we can just say, Lord, we need you. We need you. We are desperate for you. We cry out to God. But you don't know how busy I am, Pastor. I am busy doing this, and I'm busy doing that, and and that might be true. It's probably true. You probably are very busy. But what happens when you're too busy to drink from the living water that Jesus offered? David was a man after God's own heart, and one of the reasons he was is that he understood how much he needed the Lord in his life. In fact, it wasn't just uh, an inclining that he needed the Lord. No, he was desperate for God, like one who was parched, one who was thirsty in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thankfully, I have some. Did that make you thirsty? David, he longed for God. He was desperate for something to drink. And this thirst, this thirst that we have is is, is this longing for that which would sustain us. And you know, it's interesting that when we're thirsty, we don't reason with it. We don't try to reason it away and ignore it. We don't despise it. No, rather we, we, we grab a glass and we satisfy it. The only way we can satisfy our thirst is to drink. And when that thirst is a thirst of the soul, the only thing that can satisfy it is God himself. Sometimes we turn to other things, try to fill our time with that, and and some are are harmful to us, and, and they bring heartache to our lives. Other things, they might not be all that bad in in and of themselves, unless, of course, they crowd out that desire for the Lord, promising to bring satisfaction to our soul, but they can't satisfy, because the only thing that can satisfy is the Lord himself. And David knew it. He says in verse 2, I have seen you in the sanctuary, and I have beheld your power and your glory. I have tasted what you are like. I know you, and I am not willing to live my life apart from you. I am not content unless you are in my life. So earnestly I will seek you. Even when it's not easy, even when it requires some effort and some sacrifice on my part. Why? Verse 3, because your love is better than life. David understood that his life was so much fuller and richer, and deeper with the Lord in it. And so he says in verse 8, my soul clings to you. In other words, I'm not going to let go of you, Lord. I am going to stay near to your presence. I don't want to be sidetracked. I don't want to be enamored by other things. Lord, I want you. And when our children were little, learning how to crawl, they would love to grab your leg. You know how they sit on the front of your leg and you know, they sit on your foot and they kind of, you have to, you know, lift them around. How many have done that? I'm sure most of you have done that. Uh, and of course, it's fun for them. It's hard on tiring for us, but we were much younger then, so we could do it a lot easier. Uh, but Barb would oftentimes work, uh, shift work. So we would try to, while she's working, I'm home. While I'm working, she's home. And we would do that. So that meant that often I had to cook supper, which was always a little bit challenging. But it was also more challenging for the kids because they wanted, they wanted to grab my leg, they wanted to, to play, they wanted to do things, and, and I'm trying to cook supper for them. <clears throat> so I'd give them a toy or give them a cookie, but that wouldn't do because, you see, what they really wanted was me. They wanted to be held. They wanted to be picked up. And David says, that's how I am, Lord. I'm not satisfied with a toy. I'm not satisfied with a cookie. I want you. I'm desperate for you. And there's a place in our, in our walk with God that, that that is a healthy thing, a healthy crying out to God that we are saying, Lord, I want you. David affirms his relationship, but he also affirms his longing to and desire to be near to God, and then he worships. He wants to be near to God 
so that you can worship. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hand. So he uses his lips, that's the first thing. He acknowledges in verse 9 that there are those who are seeking to destroy his life. So in other words, that wilderness experience that he is facing is real. Uh, the, The challenge is real, and the danger is real. But he doesn't complain, he doesn't grumble. No, instead, he chooses to bless the Lord and praise his name. That might take place within the tabernacle. It might take place there. It might take place around the campfire as they talk about the goodness of God and they have a conversation that that magnifies and honors the Lord. In verse 5, he says, With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Did you know that God loves to hear you sing? (laughs) Not me. I sing like a sick cow, maybe. Uh, That's what you say. Uh, I sing tenor, 10 or 12 miles away. Uh, You know, all those things that we say. But you know that God takes notice when there's a song of praise, there's a song of adoration, there's a song of love that wells up within our heart. You see, it does something for our heart, too. When we say, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Wow. There's something that happens in our hearts as our our hearts are so full that we sing out the praises of God. And then he uses his hands. He says, I will lift up my hands in your name. Now, whether that be an act of prayer, because there was an aspect where that was part of the prayer, uh, posture of prayer, especially for the ancient Jewish people as they lift up their hands in prayer, but it's also an act of worship, of praise. And there's several reasons where we might lift our hands to the Lord. I think of that guy that comes with the gun behind my back and says, put him up, and we put our hands up in surrender. And there might be a moment where I say, Lord, I've been wrestling with this decision or I've been wrestling with this issue. I've been wrestling with you And in this moment, I surrender, and we lift up our hands, and we say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. We we lift our hands in victory. I know when those uh, Colorado Avalanche won the Stanley Cup, Matt's an Avalanche fan, they lifted their hands in victory. You know, and there's moments where, where we know we've just come through a desert, and we've kind of come through, and now all of a sudden we're, we're back into a place of, of growth, and, and it's flourishing. And we, we look back and we say, thank you, Lord, because you brought us through. You brought the victory. Or maybe we're just like those kids that were hanging on my leg and saying, Daddy, up. And there's those moments where we just know that we are reaching to God and we're longing to be held. We are wanting just to say, Lord, I love you. And what a powerful reminder that our hands can be used to bring God glory and honor as a sign of praise or as an act of service even. Baking a pie, we can bring God glory. Tying a skate, we can bring God glory. Reading a book, cleaning a home, building a fence, we can do all those things because Jesus says, let men see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Yes, sometimes we think it's only what we do within the walls of the church, but I think there's an aspect where we can bring God glory and worship and praise even in the things that we do outside of these walls, the things that we serve him in, and we bring glory and honor. It's interesting, when we set out to serve the Lord, and when we set out to glorify him, our souls are satisfied as well. Even though that's not our motive, that's not our heart, that's just the byproduct of loving Jesus. In verse 5, he says, My soul be satisfied as with the riches of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. And then he uses his mind. Verse 6, On my bed, I will remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. 
boy, in those times when they're challenging, when, when they're tough and there's a struggle, our minds can race as we lie awake at night, maybe trying to solve the problems. But it's important we find ourselves focusing upon the faithfulness of God because that, those moments that we marked in the past where God has been faithful, they help us in those moments then where we are facing difficulties to lift our gaze from that which is troubling us towards the God who can help us through. It's easy to wallow in pity. I think we can all do that, to worry about everything that could go wrong in life. But instead, David chooses to remember and to reflect the goodness of God. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And David says, yes, that's the God in whom I am seeking. And then, lastly, he accepts the provision of God. So he seeks God. He spends time worshiping God, and he accepts the provision of God. Verse 7, because you are my help. I will sing in the shadow of your wings. I will cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. David saw firsthand how God had protected him, how God had protected him from King Saul, who out of jealousy was trying to take David's life. 1 Samuel 23, 14, day after day, Saul searched for David, but God did not give David into his hands. How would that even be possible for him not to find David? How is that possible when he had armies searching for him without God's protection, without God's provision, without God's power? And David recognized that. Oh, David remained close to God in close proximity because he sang under the shadow of his wings. However, sometimes in our panic, sometimes in our doubt, we tend to run. We run from God. Maybe we live contrary to his commands. Maybe like the children of Israel in the wilderness, we, out of a stubborn heart, are determined to do our own thing. And then when trouble comes, we wonder, well, God, where are you? And he says, you run too far away. You cannot be under the shelter of my wing. You are there. You need to run back toward me. And hopefully in those moments, we have this moment of reflection, perhaps even a moment of repentance, because repentance means I'm going to change my direction. Instead of running after those things, I turn around and I run towards God. And when we do that, we discover, we, we, we've been saying, where's God? And, and we discover he's where he's always been. It was us that moved. Sometimes I play hide and seek with our dog. I throw the ball, and as she goes to go get it, I run and hide, and she comes back and tries to find me. I notice sometimes she just drops the ball and tries to find me instead, and then once she finds me, she goes and gets the ball because finding me is job number one. But after I've done this once or twice, then I throw the ball, and she'll run a little bit and stop and see if I'm going to run away because if I'm going to run away, she's not going to bother with the ball. She's going to run after me. Because she wants to know where I am at all times. And David says, Lord, I want to know where you are at all times. Now, the truth is God never leaves us nor forsakes us. But David says, I'm keeping my eye on you, Lord. I, 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 I don't want to be too far from you. Now, thankfully, God doesn't hide himself from us. He'll let us walk away if we want to. But as a da- as shepherd, David understood what happens to wayward sheep. He's had to rescue them from the bear, and he's had to rescue them from the lion of God. Of course, God, in those moments, David realized that it was God who rescued him from that bear and that lion. But David says, I am going to cling to God. When I was in high school, I taught swimming uh, lessons after school. So we'd walk across the the, uh, football field to the the swimming pool that was close to uh, our high school, and the first class was four- and five-year-olds. And usually, I got the scared stiff class, the ones that were so scared, you know, you try to bring them in the water, and immediately, they would lunge for your neck, 
and, and hold you so tight and then dig their nails into your back. But it didn't take long for them to discover that I wasn't going to let them drown, but that they would trust me. And as they learned to trust me, they became more confident and they might blow some bubbles or they might put their face in, might float for a second or two. And while there was other kids that were already doing that, these ones, that was a major victory in their lives. It was great progress. And it's interesting how, how there's moments where we are all at different levels of our progress with the Lord, but we need to trust him. And when we trust him, it com- gives us the confidence to obey him and to do what he asks. Remember Gideon? He's hiding from the Midian ar- Midianite army, and he's threshing his wheat. And then he receives this visit from the angel of the Lord. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you mighty warrior, or some version said, mighty man of valor. And I wonder if he thought, I'm not a mighty man of valor. Here I am hiding away. He doesn't feel like a warrior. And yet God commands him, I want you to go save Israel out of the hands of the Midianites. Well, we smile as we watch Gideon wrestle with whether or not this was God or whether or not it was just the pizza the night before. You know, he, he's wrestling with that, and we watch him place the fleece before the Lord. We smile because we do the same thing, don't we? Maybe the biggest challenge was that moment where he finally mustered the army. He had, he had 32,000 men. I mean, it paled in comparison to what the, army, the enemy had, but at least it was a lot of men. And the Lord says, yeah, it's too many. You tell the ones that are afraid to go home. And so he does. If you're trembling with fear, you can go, oh, thank you. 22,000 leave, leaving 10,000 men to face an army of 120,000. And the Lord says to him, uh, there's still too many men. Why don't you go down to the river? And those who put their head in and drink, well, they go home, the ones that lap the water and watch the horizon, making sure that the enemy isn't going to come. Those can stay Well, only 300 did that. And then Judges 7, verse 7, the Lord says to Gideon, with these 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let the other men go, each to his own place. And David might have reasoned, if God can do that for Gideon, then the smartest thing that I can do is to trust the Lord, even in this moment, where Saul and his men are trying to kill and take my life. I will trust the same God that moved in Gideon's life because that God is my God, and David affirms that. Roger Ellingsworth, in his book, Opening Up the Psalms, says, Do we believe that we can see the glory and the power of the Lord in the wilderness? You know, we look at our world, maybe we, we look at the conditions of our world and our society, and we think, oh, it's so discouraging at times. And, and we, it is. But can God move in power in the wilderness? Do we just throw up our hands and we say, it's all over? Or do we say, Lord, I hunger and I thirst for you? It's not easy going through the deserts of life where sometimes it feels like all our efforts are for naught where it feels like instead of thriving, we're just surviving. But remember, again, it's in the wilderness that Jacob had the vision of the angels ascending and descending the earth. It was in the desert of Sinai that God met Moses up on the mountain and gave him the Ten Commandments. And so when the devil tells us that God cannot be found in the desert, let's remember that he is a liar. God is not only present, but that he's able and he has demonstrated time and time again that he can accomplish his purposes even in the dry and barren seasons of life. So what do we do? We affirm. We affirm our relationship with him. We declare that he is our God. And if he isn't your God, then the deserts are very difficult because you're looking for help and there's no help to be found but he can be your God, and that can change right now. You can ask Jesus to come into your life, and you can ask him to help you and sustain you. 
not necessarily going to always remove you out of the desert. Maybe he'll just help you walk through, but you'll find strength and resolve and courage and direction. But you have to give your life to Jesus. And maybe you want to do that right now. Maybe you don't know the Lord or you're watching online. And it begins with a prayer. We can pray right now. Lord, I come to you today because I recognize that I need you. And I want you in my life. And I believe that it's possible because of what Jesus accomplished through his death and resurrection. Forgive me for trying to live independently of you. Include also my other sins. I want to love you and serve you like David did. So I'm asking you to be my God and my Savior. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, then you've begun a new relationship with God. And like other relationships, there's a lot of learning that takes place. That you learn more about that other person. You learn what they like, what they don't like, and, and how to grow in that relationship. And we'll learn how to grow closer to God. So do what David did. Seek him. Spend time reading your Bible and praying. If you don't have a Bible, we'll help you with that. Sing songs of praise. Start listening to music that will bring glory and honor to God. There's so many things that will discourage us or distract us, but if we listen to that which will bring God glory and honor, then our hearts will be built up and then serve him with an obedient heart. And as you delight in him, you will find and you will sense him delighting in you. Deuteronomy 4.29 says, but if from there you seek the Lord, your God, you will find him. If you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul, even if you are in the desert place, even if you're in the wilderness, God is there. So, have you been feeling dry in your spirit? Is there a longing in your soul for greater intimacy with God? I would hope so. I pray so. And this morning, as we sing, we're going to just sing and, and worship the Lord, but maybe you want to just remain seated and, and pray, or maybe you want to turn around on your pew and kneel and, and say, God, I need you. I affirm my relationship with you. Lord, we need you. In Canada, we need the Lord. And we see this. Our world needs the Lord. And it was so we see the desperate need. But, oh, that we as God's people might experience him afresh and anew. So, Lord, we do pray. We pray, O oh Lord, for our own hearts and our souls. We recognize, Lord, that in many ways, this, this is the last few years has sure felt like the wilderness. It's been challenging and it's been difficult and we've been stretched in ways we've never been stretched before. And, and Lord, maybe we feel exhausted and tired and, and fed up even. But in the midst of it all, we know you're there, and we know you're faithful, and we know you're true. And so let our hearts be filled, O oh Lord, with a desperate cry, a desperate thirst for you. As a deer panteth for the water, so my soul longs after you. And we sense David praying these types of prayers all throughout the Psalms. And so, Lord, let our hearts, let our hearts have that same passion for you, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.